Thank you so much. Okay. Excellent. Where was, where was that, lady? It's um. It was. Uh, you see this pause, stop recording. Oh, it's right was, down there. I didn't see that before. Yes. Well, okay. basically, where it looks like their menus, just keep yeah. looking. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Here we go. All right. Let's see here. I got a share screen. And here we go. I'm going to share that. Share this. All right. Before we uh, before we dig into um, the topic today, uh, I bumped into this photograph of a beaver cutting a branch off of a, a, a small tree. And I realized that there's one thing in the Beaver lecture that I, for, I failed to mention to all of you that I should have mentioned. And that is that before Europeans started hunting and trapping beaver to get their skins, to get the fur, to make top hats, before that, almost every small stream in North America had a beaver dam on it a very, very large number of beaver dams. So that when there was heavy rain anywhere, those dams held up the, the drainage. So in general terms, the big rivers did not flood because all the little tributaries to the big rivers had these small dams on them, which would slow down the flow of water to the big rivers. When people got in here and eliminated the beaver, that eliminated the beaver dams. With a the consequence, then there, there was much, much more major flooding on major rivers in North America, leading to even today, where these big rivers like the Mississippi and the Ohio and the Missouri, which have these horrible floods in the spring, and uh, at times during rainy times of the year, um, those floods would not have been nearly as abundant nor as intense as they are today. So if you could imagine what would happen in North America if you were to go back and put a small beaver dam on every one of literally millions of small tributaries scattered over the countryside. So the removal of the beaver had a major, major ecosystem impact on the whole North American um, continent. They didn't get down to Mexico. Um, I don't know whether they really got to the Gulf of Mexico, but certainly they were as far south as uh, Missouri and um, uh, Georgia and the Carolinas. And um, uh, just the outcome is, is that's what, and today people don't appreciate this. They don't realize this. So they don't realize what the impact was of the removal of this basic one species. Uh, from our North American continent. So that's that's the thing that I, I failed to tell you when we did the beaver lecture, but I wanted to say it now. And what's happening now is, of course, is that the Eurasian beaver, the old world one, is being introduced into, into England, in the UK, right now, by people who think it'd be very nice to have it. But they, they imagine that they can control its presence. Well, they certainly will not be able to. So it's going to have the same serious, from some viewpoints, major impact on the UK countryside as they run around cutting down trees, small trees, uh, and putting dams on streams, um, just like they do in North America, uh, or like they did in North America, and as they did in Europe as well before they were nearly extinguished in Europe also. Um, so that's going to be a major impact. And we already have one example of that from Southern South America, the bottom end of Chile and the bottom end of Argentina, where uh, they were introduced in the 40s, right after World War II, um, from, from the idea of they're just a nice animal and they could be for fur and for meat. Um, and they went crazy eating all the vegetation. So the major, major impact on the bottom end of, of uh, Tierra del Fuego 
uh, Argentina um, and Chile on the vegetation there from the beaver introduced from North America. Okay, so we'll leave that and go on. Now, today's lecture or talk is, um, is doing it here, I've got to get rid of that, that one. Huh, there we go. No, just a minute here. All right, there we go. All right, today deals with a detailed examination of a, um, a project that you've already heard pieces of. But I want to tell it to you as a whole project, not just a fragment here and a fragment there, so that it, it, it sort of rides in your mind as a case study or as a, a, a pilot study or, a, or a, a, an example of the use of tropical biodiversity for, uh, without destroying it, uh, the use of it to, uh, to, to do things that are viewed as good from the viewpoint of, of the humans who live there. So now this is the opening slide for a meeting in Cancun, Mexico uh, in 2017, when uh, there was a, an enormous global conference made up of many thousands of people who um, came there to talk about um, conservation of biodiversity and many other environmental situations. And um, I was invited by the Costa Rican government to give a talk at that meeting. And so that's basically what this talk is. Now there's some key words on this, on this opening slide. One of them is biomonitoring. In other words, this is using biology to monitor an impact, all right? impact is that of a geothermal site, which we're going to talk about in detail. Um, so it's biomonitoring to perceive the impact of, this is not about endangered species or something like that. This is making use of the insects to understand what is the impact of this de development project in an original forest, like the one you're seeing, seeing here. Whoops, sorry. Let me go back here. Hmm. For reasons I don't understand, we you, just you lost need, my slide. You might you might need to click click on the slide with, with your. Neither mouse. of them are working here. Hmm. I don't know what to do. Um, do hmm. can, Neither one can, wants to go forward. Can can you can you click on the uh, arrow on, on the the uh, left? bottom yeah there suddenly it went forward but it's now you won't can, go you, backwards either you can you can click on the other one to maybe. ah we got the arrow down here in the lower yeah. left corner yeah i don't know what's going on but uh, we'll just continue on here and the point being is that this development is on the margin that's why this word is in black of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Now, the, I think I mentioned to you this earlier time is that UNESCO, the uh, United Nations uh, environmental concern people in Europe and the rest of the world, go around and, and decreeing sites to be of worldwide importance. And this whole ACG, the whole conservation area, is um, a, a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So if something's going wrong, wrong environmentally in the vicinity of this World Heritage Site, this entity here, this, this international entity gets very upset and comes and inspects and, and writes formal letters to the government and does all kinds of things. But if the resource to be gar harvested or dealt with is outside of it, they only get excited if they think it will still have an impact on the uh, inside of the UNESCO site, okay? Well, this particular site, which is right at the base of this volcano you see over here on the right-hand side, is on the margin. And suddenly that has become fashionable because people who want to do something, harvest something from inside a UNESCO site, often discover that right on the margin, they can get the same thing they wanted without being inside. So they can get away with doing, and often, 
environmental damage on the margin. So this became a sort of a buzzword. This became a, a special extra um, consideration for a pilot project. Now, our names are down here, but that doesn't matter. That was just required. Uh, but the point is, this is on the margin of a World Heritage Site in Costa Rica in this case. Now, I have to, this is to an audience from all over the world. And so I have to start it by pointing out where this is taking place. So here's Costa Rica right there. Just a minute, let me get my little pointer down here. There's Costa Rica right there. You have to remind people where it is. Now the actual photograph here is in the Toronto Zoo, which happens to have this nice world globe so I could take a picture of it. Now the point being here, why do I have a photograph of this to show people where Costa Rica is? Because I walk around all over the world with my camera in my hand all the time. And I, you look at things, you talk about things, you move on. I take pictures of them. And I've been storing these photographs for 50 years. And the outcome is that I have this enormous bulk of stuff, which didn't seem particularly relevant at the time, which I can then pull out from and use it for lectures like this or for public global talks. And all I'm doing is encouraging you to not view photographs as sort of throwaway items like a word on the street, but view photographs as items which you can now store, of course, very conveniently and store and take care of as long as you put labels on them so you can find them again later on. Now, this is where Costa Rica sits. So here our project is sitting uh, right inside of this piece right there. And um, uh, here is the uh, uh, Caribbean over here and Costa Rica is on this side. I mean, the Pacific Ocean is on this side. And um, the point being that this is the dry season and this is all yellow brown from being dry without rain. So it's not green, but here's the clouds right here. So the continental divide and the, the volcanic ridge runs right through the middle of Costa Rica. So this side here gets the wind coming across the Atlantic. It hits these mountains, rises up, condenses cold, it gets colder, condenses and drops its water there. So there's a very sharp line right here between the, the rainforest on this side and the dry forest on this side. This project is exactly on that line of join between the two. And where we work right here on this margin, we have the fauna and flora of the dry forest and the same fauna and flora of the rainforest over there. So this thing here, this fauna and flora from here extends all the way up here to Northern Mexico and all the way down to Pacific South America. This one over here on the rainforest side extends all the way up to Texas or just South of Texas uh, in Mexico and extends all the way down to, to Bolivia in South America. So right here on this line, there's a huge lump of both faunas and floras. And at the particular site, this particular site of the geothermal thing is sitting right on that. And it's the only piece protected in all of Central America. All the rest is agricultural land. So all of a sudden this has very special biological importance, as well as the legal importance that comes from it being a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And it comes from it being inside a national park or right on the margin of a national park. Okay. Now, Costa Rica itself, uh, this area that you see in the lump here to give you some sense of scale, it's 2% of Costa Rica is this piece right here. That's the conservation area. And it contains 2.6% of the world's biodiversity. If you added up all the biodiversity, terrestrial biodiversity around the world, this comes out to two and a half percent of it sitting right there in that little tiny lump. And remember Costa Rica here, very small, put up here on North America, very small, as acres, as hectares, as square kilometers is nothing. It's a tiny little piece, meaning nothing. But if you count biodiversity, 4% of the world is in Costa Rica and 4% of the world is North America. 
So to give you some sense of scale, what we're dealing with in these two circumstances. In other words, there's a hell of a lot of stuff packed in a very small area right here. So that's itself a reason for taking care of it and, and conserving it. But also, of course, that's a huge resource with which to do things. Okay. So here's where we are. This is the conservation area in the northern piece of Costa Rica. The huge storm, the hurricane that's going on literally as I'm talking to you is hitting Nicaragua just to the north and Honduras up to the north of that. That huge area uh, up, up north, uh, which is being subject to the worst hurricane that's ever in, been recorded, uh, is of course has edges. And that edges right now, it's raining like crazy right, right here. Okay, that's the rain on the edge of the hurricane that's hitting up there. And the site we're going to is where this star is right there. Okay, so that's where the, we are on the margin. So here's the ACG down at ground level, a more three dimensional kind of version. And the project is right here. Now, why is there a geothermal project there? Why isn't it just any other kind of place? Well, a million and a half years ago, there was a huge volcano right here, probably three times the volume of what you see now. And all of this below here was Lake Nicaragua, which is this just a little edge of it up here on this corner, extended all the way down into central Costa Rica. This a million and a half years ago, this enormous volcano blew up and the entire contents of it filled all of this. So that left a huge crater right here on the edge of all this land looking like the moon because there'd be nothing there. It was just dirt or rock, okay? That crater filled up would have been a big lake inside from rainwater. 50,000 years ago, this volcano came up in the same crater, grew up through it and effectively put a top on that bowl of water. So now you have a top on the bowl of water and the bowl of water is underneath it heated by the earth, so it boils. So a geothermal site is, you come along to this, you stick a big pipe down and by drilling down into this and guide that boiling water and steam out and use it to run an electric turbines. And this one site has enough potential for that to cover a third of the Costa Rican, of the country of Costa Rica's electricity needs. So we're talking about a huge, valuable resource from an economic standpoint, sitting right underneath. And this is where you have easy access. You see, if you put a pipe in from up above, you'd be passing all this rock and dirt. If you go out here, there isn't any lake out here. So you, you go out here and this is where you set your site. It's right on the edge of the World Heritage Site. So here the World Heritage Site is this white line that you see going along like, going like that. That's our boundary, okay? So it's right just outside there. So here's what that looks like in a formal map, all right? Dry forest here, rainforest the green, cloud forest on the tops of the volcanoes, and right on the edge is right here is where the geothermal site is where we're going. This is the, 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 the crew of people who run that 2% of the country. Um, you've seen parts of them already before as paratexonomists and development on the front door. You've also seen that one as well. Now, we go back to this map. We drop down to there. And now the green that you see here, all the green is basically original forest. And basically the white that you see all around it like this is in fact agricultural landscape. So we're right on the edge of where the forest has survived and out here where it's all been destroyed. So now we're looking right at the site itself. So here's the ACG up here. This is the conserved, the formal conserved UNESCO World Heritage Site National Park and all of that. The boundary is this yellow line. And this is private land outside which the government owns and bought for a geothermal project. So here the government owns it for conservation. Here, it owns it for 
economic development. So this is the National Electric Company is this word that you see right here. And uh, this is the actual name of the site is Pilus 2 right here. And uh, as you see here, geothermal development. Okay, so this is the physical structure. Now, underneath that is the resource. That is the chunk that the world wants access to, to get that boiling water to run turbines. Now, in a normal non-conservation world, all of this forest would already be gone because the first thing these people would have done in developing the site would have been to clear a large quantity of the forest, it just gets in the way, put roads in, put power plants in, do all kinds of industrial development here. But because it's on the edge, on the margin right here, and because now this is where it gets interesting biopolitically. This the National Electric Company here basically owns Costa Rica. They own everything underground and the resources underground. Now the park owns everything above ground. Now what's underground? By law, the National Electric Company, a government, owns everything underground. So they could simply walk in and clear all of this in order to get at what's underground. However, the conservation area here has the reputation for being very obnoxious towards people who decide to do things like that, whether it's gold mining or whether it's water harvest for irrigation or whether it's timber for whatever purpose. Um, we, we have worked very, very, very hard to develop a reputation and a reality of not allowing industrial development to take place. Okay, so there was a Greenpeace type war over this site because the electric company started this site and their intention was to spread it to everywhere. And we put our foot down in many different ways. The director of the conservation area very nearly got fired uh, for objecting to this entry by industry. Um, and um, this entry attempt was being driven by an old engineer who had spent his life building geothermal projects all over the country of Costa Rica. And they were very, very important for the electricity of Costa Rica. So he was very much on a throne. He was very much at the top end of the sort of the social structure. And then he died. When he died, the small guys, the men, the, what we call middle management and the workers in the field who had heard us say, but had always been ignored, that if we could only work together, we could figure out how to do this site without destroying the forest. He was having nothing, but he died in, 20, in 2012. And um, so nobody knew what to do because that left everything in limbo. Six months later, the middle level people from the electric company came to the offices of the national park and said, um, we would like to show you what we would like to do. Now that's like Apple going to Google or to Bill Gates and saying, this is what we're gonna do for the next five years. You don't do that in industry. But they had heard us talk. They already knew what kind of a war it was gonna be, a Greenpeace type war for them to start developing this. So they came and spent an hour putting their plan on a screen and making a presentation to about 50 staff members of the conservation area. We got to the end and it was obviously they were making a peace overture, but they didn't say that. We got to the end and I said um, to the park director, can I stick my finger in this? And he said, well, you can try, but they won't listen to you. I said, but can I try? 
said, okay. So I stood up and said to the speaker, I said, could I borrow your slides that you've just shown all of us? And show you what I would do if this was my project with your, your slides. He turned to his boss, who was a higher guy from a higher up guy from, from the electric company. They had their conversation in the corner. He came back and said, okay, if you don't tell anybody. Meaning they weren't going to tell anybody either. But what they were gonna do is let us experiment with this. So I stood up and said to them, look, imagine that the National Science Foundation had just given me a $20 million grant to biomonitor the impact of a geothermal site on the biodiversity of this forest. As you can see, the same forest here is the same as it is here. I mean, the for, from a biological standpoint, these are identical. And I would record what actually happens when you cut this hole right here in the forest. But I don't have any money. National Science Foundation hasn't given National Science Foundation has not given us anything for this kind of stuff. So you are going to have to end up paying the bill. But I won't charge you anything to begin. We'll all be sweat equity. We'll just put our labor and effort into it, making it do. Will you let us have permission to do that? They had their conversation. They came back and they said, okay, go ahead. I said, if you're serious, we were out to leave the country three days later. I said, you have to take us to this site and show us exactly what you're going to do on the ground. In the next three days, the government actually did that. They actually brought us there, showed us the stakes stuck in the ground where the road was going to be, where the, where the platform was going to be, all of this sort of stuff. And I said, okay, when your bulldozer enters the first day, when you start to clear the road and start to clear the site, I will have the paradoxonomist go in and set up malaise traps to monitor using the insects as a thermometer for the effect of this. Because from a viewpoint of conservation, this is a horrible thing. I mean, it's just it's like a bomb has dropped on the forest. And uh, it's very easy to get emotional about that, especially if you don't have as big an area as we have, happen to have here in this particular case. And like I say, it's right on the margin here. So the UNESCO was all excited about would this then impact here and here and here? In other words, would it have a big impact or would it only be where the hole is? So they started working and the paradoxonomist went and set up the traps. So what we were asking is the basic, from our standpoint, academic question was, how can you extract from a platform like this with minimal impact on the forest around it? How do you measure and perceive that impact? How do you know what the impact is on out here in the forest? And then how do you compensate for whatever the damage is? So these were the big industrial questions. Interestingly enough, the industry was quite willing to pay for the damage if we could put a price tag on it. That was the hard part. How do you have numbers that tell you where the compensation should be and how much it should cost? Now, classically, in this kind of circumstance, people go out and measure with camera traps the big animals that are present for two reasons. One is that often these big animals, this is right at the geothermal site here, the one that's a, a mother mountain lion and her, her teenage kid here. Um, these big animals are often endangered species. So if you do something which will threaten the endangered species, the society, the laws, the NGOs, the, the, the Greenpeace people get very upset. 
And so you end up with major conflicts, legal conflicts and all kinds of conflicts, right? Now, how do you ask this mountain lion whether it objects to a geomethorial site or not? How do you ask whether it's bothered by it? Because if there are no people on the geothermal site, the mountain lion just walks right across it. It's just another piece of dry riverbed from his standpoint. It's impossible. You can't interview him. And furthermore, he shows no evidence as he walks, or in this case, the mother walks across the geothermal site. It doesn't react to it at all. It reacts to people, but not to the site itself. Well, then people will suggest, well, why don't you count small mammals? Well, here's the Lyomis mouse that you guys already know. This is our, this is our census of those little mammals from 1983 all the way up to 2016. And this is the number of them present in a forest just like this one. How would you measure anything in a population that does this over time? In other words, this is a ruler which is constantly changing its scale and unpredictably up and down, up and down, and then doesn't change at all for years after years after year. Part of that is food supply for these guys. Part of it is the predators for these guys. Here's another one individual here with some fingers just to give you some scale. Um, but the point is this is a very subject single species. Now, maybe if you were dealing with 150 species of small mammals, we could do something else. But with just one, and this is the only small mammal on that forest floor, um, no way. So we began to put the malaise traps right in here. These are the insects, of course, that go to the malaise traps, along with a whole lot of other insects. We asked the company, engineering company, for their actual engineering plans for the site itself, the access road, and related pieces as well. These are the industrial secrets, okay? And that cost a lot of money to build this map that you see right here. We suddenly had this in our hands so we could say, okay, we'll put the malaise traps here, 50 meters out, 150 meters out, another line just like that, another line just like this. And we'll look to see how the insects in these different traps respond to the presence of making this thing right here. So this is the beginning. This is what I meant by the bomb. It really, I mean, I know this forest very well. It's been a friend and a help to me for decades. And suddenly to have a bulldozer do this to it, a chainsaw and a bulldozer to do this to it is um, not, not easy. It's not easy to stand there and watch this happen. But there's the malaise trap from day one right there. So as this platform is being cleared, we're now measuring what's the relationship of the whole insect community, thousands and thousands of species. As later on, six months later, it's now three, four months later, they're polishing the site, so developing a small uh, reservoir of water over here. They're polishing the site to get it ready for the actual drilling. And the trap is still sitting right there. Now we're into the drilling a year later. This thing is going down two to three kilometers. And then guess what? It bends and goes over underneath the park. You see, the old days, the concept was you had to stick the drill, the, the pipe straight into the hot water. I don't know that you remember the war between uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and, uh, well, the, the, the various, let's just run this, the various wars in, uh, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, or in Arabia uh, over who owns the oil. Well, a lot of that was due to one country doing side drilling where you drill down and then you put your pipe over underneath the other country. But that was developed for oil drilling, for oil well extraction. What they did was then in trying to get, a, get to the resource underneath the park without damaging the piece above ground was to do the same kind of side drilling 
So this pipe goes straight down for about two kilometers and then gradually it bends over and goes underneath over here. But you still need a platform on the edge to do that. Right? So here's our malaise trap sitting right there. So all the noise, the light, the, the confusion of people going in and out and doing things, all that sort of stuff, that's all taking place um, while you're visually measuring what's going on by who gets caught in these traps. There's the trap close up. You all know what these things look like. Uh, here's the, the, the uh, drilling site is here on, on my left here and the forest understory is on the right. Now, I'm gonna say a little detail here that means a lot to entomologists, to people who are actually uh, doing this kind of stuff in the field, but it sounds like a fine detail, but it's actually turned out to be a very interesting fine detail. Um, I think I mentioned it to you once before, but I'll, I'll mention it again. Um, this trap is catching insects by the insects flying in and hitting that screen in the middle there. And they try to escape by going up. There's a hole up here. They go through the hole and fall on a bottle of alcohol, which is right here. The bottle is actually unscrewed. See, it's sitting on the ground uh, and it would be screwed in here. And the insects accumulate in that alcohol. And once every, every Thursday, uh, one of the parataxonomists goes and collects this. But there are nine of these now that are on this site. Okay. Now, notice that the bottle is on the side towards the open here. If you took this trap and just turned it around, put the bottle on this side over here, you get a very different result. Now, why? What happens is the insects that are out here tend to be sun-loving insects. They tend to be insects that are of sunny places. And the sunny place can be an open field. That's where you would think of them. But what we think of them as is in the canopy, things way up here at the top. But what are they doing down here then? Because from the canopy's view, canopy insect viewpoint, this is the canopy. Sunny, windy, dries out fast, so from the standpoint of the insect, it doesn't matter whether it's a meter off the ground or 40 meters off the ground. If you turn the trap around, you catch the insects who are from the shade and have ventured out to some degree. And when they get caught, they try to go to the shade. So if you have the bottle here, you catch those insects. You'll get the shade insects and you don't get very many of the sun-loving insects. If you have the trap this way, you get the sun-loving insects and not many of the shade insects. So there's a little tiny detail, but where this comes in is when the engineering people come and look at this trap and try to understand this, their first reaction is, oh, we want to take some of those traps and put them somewhere in some of our other sites around hydroelectric dams, around geothermal sites, around the roads that go in and out of them, and do the same thing. But they have to learn the little details of how to set the traps and how to interpret the results from the traps. It isn't just a matter of plunk it down and walk away. Now, anybody can change the model, but the person who sets the trap has to be thinking very carefully about what it is that they're doing. So here's the bottle with the insects in it from, from what's one, one, one week worth of, of insects in that, from that malaise trap. So in effect, the malaise trap is like a weather station. The weather station collects raindrops. You pool the raindrops at the time of day and you interpret that for however you care about rain or whatever the agricultural use is there and all that and you getting wet, not getting wet, hurricane and all these things. The weather station, you read the results from the weather station. Well, what's a matter of reading the results from this? So the reading results from a weather station are accumulations of rain data, which gives you a graph like that, right? How much rain has fallen per year for 20 years. The results from this gives you a, a, a barcode tree, which compares one insect with another insect with another insect so it allows you to say who is what by their DNA. So what they're doing then is you take the results from the malaise trap, single individual, you take one leg off, and that one leg goes in a little plastic 
well on a plastic plate. There it is. You can see the, the leg going into the plate. That's got enough DNA there to identify the insect with no problem at all. You can imagine this is a very tiny fly, like one of the little tiny Drosophila that Ozan works with. Well, we can take one leg off that little tiny, tiny um, Drosophila fly and get the full genome for that fly out of that one leg. It goes into this robot and the robot does the actual extraction and sequencing. And out of this, you get, this is raw data. This is like raw rainfall data. This is these, every one of these lines across here is a DNA profile of the barcode, of the DNA barcode. And it's this gene right here that's actually being captured. This is the mitochondrial genome. And this is, this, this, this mitochondrial genome is passed from mother to daughter to daughter the daughter, the daughter. So what we're really doing is measuring the, uh, using the, this piece of the CO1 gene right here as the identifier for that species based on the female lineage. And that's what the actual barcode looks like. I believe I've shown you this before, but just to emphasize to you that it's a 650 letter word, well, more or less, it could be 550 words. I mean, 550 letters. Um, uh, but it's a four letter alphabet. And so that's the barcode right there that goes with that particular fly. Okay. And, and the, the, again, the little tiny details are, in this case, this is a fly that I reared from a caterpillar, a parasite of a caterpillar. Here's the voucher code for the caterpillar. Here's the voucher code for the fly who came from the caterpillar, because of course they don't have the same DNA at all. So we have to have a, a, a DNA barcode for the fly. And also we get a DNA barcode for the caterpillar that it came from. And then this little note here, which just reminds people in the museum that this specimen now is one who actually lost a leg to be identified by DNA. Now those traps caught an enormous number of insects. Okay? In this particular case, six of those traps is 136,000 insects of 11,000 species, and 5,000 of them were only one time. So in other words, there was, the, the trap only caught one individual or one member, sorry, one member of that species um, during an entire year. And the cost is this. Now you see, when you pick up scientific papers, in a journal and you read them, almost never is there a financial analysis of what it costs to produce the data in that paper. This is a taboo subject. And if you start putting it in your research papers, the editors will start trimming it out. But this paper about all of this was written not just for biologists, it was written for the industrial people. It was written for the conservationists and they all wanna know what is the cost of these operations in detail? So for them, it's terribly important. So these budgetary figures are actually in the re paper that reports these data. And uh, that's what the engineers care about. That's what the industrial people care about. Because and in fact, it was very striking to us in the very beginning of this project when we went out of the forest to see where it was going to be. Their financial manager from the electric company came along as sort of curiosity, but listening. And as we described all this, he sidled up to me and whispered in a low voice, but how are we going to budget for this if you don't know how many insects are going to be caught in each trap? That's what he was focused on. And that's the answer question we had to answer. So what we had to do was sit down and figure out what we thought would be the average number of insects caught over the, seven, over the six traps and then divide that by six. And we ended up saying, okay, we guess $60,000 per trap per year. Oh, okay. The amount of money didn't matter to him. It was that he could define it in his budgets. That is what mattered to him. So what happens here is when you do science normally, doing scientific research, you're thinking of your audience as being other people kind of like you the people who read your journal, the people who are in another lab down the hall. And they all have the same kind of traditions. What we found very interesting in this whole exercise was that as we started trying to, to 
to provide usefulness to the conservation people, to the biology people, to their engineering kinds of people, we had three different sets of criteria and three different sets of what's good and what's bad. And we had to combine all three of those into one thing. And we got a very, fortunately, we got one Norwegian editor who thought this was a very interesting kind of scientific paper. So he was willing to accept it in a science journal. But if we had tried to submit it to many of the standard science journals, it would have been rejected. Now, what do we catch? A very large number of species, yes, but it wasn't just randomly distributed sets of species. This is a color wheel showing the numbers of individuals of families of insects caught in that one year. So what you're seeing is a very large number of families over here with just a few species in each one. And then some medium ones and bigger ones. And then one family which contained an enormous proportion, that's almost a quarter of the, no, it's not really a quarter, sorry. That's more than half a quarter. That's an eighth of the total catch of, 11, of 120 odd thousand individuals. This is one family of flies, Cecidium aedi. That's what the blue is right here. And what do these, these are what the flies look like. They look kind of like, it's got some of my fingertip. They look like uh, mosquitoes, but they don't feed as adults. They just mate, lay their eggs. So how do you get literally thousands of species of these little flies in one place? Literally thousands. Well, it turns out that a serious number of these things are detritus feeder, meaning that the fallen litter on the ground surface has got fungi eating the, the fallen litter, the leaves and the twigs and the bird shit and the insect shit and the cat, cat, carcasses of dead insects and all this stuff, which is food for the fungi at ground level. The larvae of these flies are specialized on that food source. So this supports an enormous number of these little tiny insects. And then there's a whole lot more. So this is the kind of raw data. Now, as we go along, oh, I'm going to see, okay. As we go along, we follow this thing through its various cycles because it, it goes in, it's drilled, uh, works, does its stuff and goes away and then goes back again a year later and so on. So we had a chance also to ask as this system changes out here, how does the insect community respond to sitting in that malaise trap right there? Well, first let's look at, oh, I'm sorry, in this graph, just to give you some idea here, this, this brown area up here is temperature. This is what a classical tropical system temperature looks like. Extremely constant. Look at this in the average temperature throughout the year. So you can see why the tropics get the reputation of being uniform. It's one place. These are the maximum temperatures. These are the minimum temperatures right here. And um, let's just put this in scale. Um, this is uh, sitting here at about uh, the minimum is about 18, what you would call a, a, a chilly spring night. And uh, up here is about um, you know, just shy of 30 degrees, well, around 30, depending on the dry season. It's uh, peaks like this. The rainy season, it drops down to here. These maximum here, um, would, would this would be uh, like, uh, uh, this over here would be like August in Philadelphia, and this over here would be um, in spring in, in Philadelphia. Now that's the temperature there. The blue bars are the rainfall. So as I said before, the dry season gets very hot, and the dry season has no rain. So that, that's an obvious relationship there. Um, each one of these lines is one trap. So at first glance, at first glance, five of these traps are basically telling you the same thing. They look like they're telling you the same thing if you don't look very closely. But one trap has gone nuts. Look at this one up here. This is the number of species caught 
by that one trap on a per week basis. Okay, so this is the peak here, is how many species were caught in a week. And then the lows are down here. But what you see is during the dry season, the, fall, the number of species declines. Why? Because it's not wet and not as wet. And so this is not their reproductive stage. This is where they're basically dormant, pupae, eggs, um, and slow, slow, some slow developing larvae. But basically, it's a relatively inactive time of year. The rains start, as you can see right here, and suddenly the number of species goes way up. This is because there's a lot of species out there flying around doing courtship and mating. So they get caught in your traps. But what do those species do after they mate it? They lay their eggs and die. So suddenly the population of things gets falls way down to here. So right in here, most of these species that are present are sent there as larvae, which are not flying. These are immatures, eating, getting bigger. And then as they go through their development and they start to come out as adults, it's back up again. This is the ones that are emerging now. At the, so this is this, the next generation here. Okay. However, if you look carefully at these graphs down here, you can see there's a peak right here. That peak right there is coincidental with this peak right here. So in other words, this is generated by the rains as well. But what we knew is we have basically five, we have basically five repetitions here against this one up here. So what is that trap as compared to these traps? Let me see, I have a, so I'm gonna go back to the map for a second. That trap that's way out of plane is this trap right here. The others, sorry, the others, are the traps that are in the shade. And there was another trap on the edge also, where they had his bottle turned around the other way. By accident, because we weren't thinking about these things, the bottle was turned towards the shade. So it caught things that live in the shade. And so all this is basically the shade response. This is the sunlight response out here. And the the difference between these two makes all the difference in the world in what you think is going on in the site. Okay. So um, a very interesting thing happened, which I don't have in this graph. Two years later, we kept this thing rolling. Two years later, one of these traps who was the edge was moved from the edge back 50 meters because they enlarged the platform by 50 meters. So when they moved it back 50 meters, it ended up next to the deep shade one that was 50 meters inside. But by cutting 50 meters, making the platform 50 meters bigger, they then exposed the trap that was on the inside to sunlight. And that trap happened to have its bottle towards the sunlight. So immediately it turned into a trap like this one. Those are the things that got caught. As soon as they expanded the project out to that second, so now these two traps are sitting there, one with its bottle towards the sun, one with a bottle towards the shade, only three meters apart. And the one trap that's got its bottle towards the shade stays just like this down here. And the one bottle that now has the finally exposed sun goes like this one here. Now, this is just looking at three traps, okay, inside the shade. So they fall more or less the same pattern like this, okay. Now, we can ask if you have three traps, how does the proportion of different insects change these three traps? From deep side, deep shade, deep shade. So these are three experiments, if you like, running parallel to each other. And notice what happens here is the flies, this blue thing, and it turns out to be the same proportion of the total circle. The beetles turn out to be the same proportion. The, the wasps and ants turn out to be the same. The moths turn out to be the same. 
In other words, each trap in the deep shade is catching basically the same thing in terms of proportions of different groups of insects. But there's almost no overlap between the species. In other words, we're sampling an enormous pool. So you stick your hand in and you just grab what you could get. Well, because there are many, 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 many species, each one at a very, very low density, you get the same proportions of the different major groups, beetles, flies, moths, wasps, but the different species, each handful has got different species in it. Now, um, so now we have a, a, a baseline for what happens when you put the platform in. I'm going to skip over this right now. Well, this is the pair I was talking about. Sorry. This is the pair that I was talking about. This one has got its bottle towards the shade here. This one's got its bottle towards the sun out here. And when that happened, suddenly this guy here started catching enormous numbers of insects. And this guy did not. So now we have edge. So here's the platform here. Here's the forest. Now we're several years later. And we look at the insects that are in this piece right here, the edge. The trap three, the one that we were looking at that's way out of line. We ask, who are those insects? Where do they come from? Well, here's one right here, that thing there. And here's another, it's the same species, these two. Well, it just so happens that I happen to know by accident enough to know that this pair, this species right here, is a major agricultural pest that lives on the root, the larvae, live on roots of corn plants. Now here we are in the middle of a bloody rainforest like this where there's no corn for anywhere, no agriculture anywhere. What have we actually done? We have created the edge of a cornfield. In other words, as soon as we created this, but where did they come from? What you come to realize is, as you start looking at all of this, this gets to be the biological part, which the engineers don't really care about, is that an agricultural zone is constantly creating a cloud of migrating and lost insects being blown away, flying away from the agricultural landscape, which is in this case, five kilometers away. What happens to them normally? They fall in the forest and die. No food plants, no life of the kind of life they're used to. And they either die of starvation or they get eaten by predators or they're just lost. They have nothing, they don't reproduce. We go in and cut a hole in the forest and that piece of this flying representation of the agricultural landscape falls in the hole. And so they take up home right here, sunlight, weeds. This plant right here is a very common plant in old fields and pastures just outside. And so this is from the life, it's just a very narrow strip of agricultural landscape. Well, the second thing of this narrow strip along the edge here is we know these butterflies very well. We've been rearing them for years and years. Here's the caterpillar one down here. This guy here normally lives in the canopy. That's where home is. But here we are down in this, in this right here. And there's a little house made by the first instar larva of the egg from the egg laid by one of these. Down at ground level, what's happened? From this butterfly standpoint, the sun and the wind and the dryness up here is the same as it is down here. So they, their, their habitat suddenly expands to cover not only up here, but down here also. And down here, they then grow up and develop. So now suddenly we have two sources of strange insects on the edge here that don't seem to belong in the forest. One is from the agricultural landscape. The other is from high overhead where biologists never look. They're there all the time. We know they're there because we reared them and found them down and not. But the point being, that the canopy species come down here too. So suddenly what looks like perturbation is in fact providing a little habitat that's a mimic of up here and a place that's a mimic of the disturbed areas outside. So now you look down on this platform, it's a drone photograph 
Look down on this platform, and here's our trap right here. And um, wow, what an eyesore, you know, gorgeous original rainforest out here. National Park boundary right over here. And you say, well, okay, but what we discovered was that, oh, I forgot to stress to you, is that the 50 meter out traps and the 150 meter out traps show no effect of the existence of this platform. In other words, if you looked at the data in those traps, you have no way of distinguishing the traps that are 50 meters out and 150 meters out from each other um, and the, the three different lines. You can't tell them apart, but the edge ones, you can tell apart. You can determine this one. So suddenly what we discovered by looking carefully is that the impact of this footprint and this one down here is a, goes on for about 10 to 20 meters. So that's the real hole. It's not just the margin, but it isn't sort of everywhere. It's just the hole. Now, I should have to add here, this is the analysis from the first year of data. We kept going until this year. So we just, in October, uh, we just stopped this after six years. So we have six years of data continuing all of these blaze traps and all our catches. And we're in the process of analyzing them now to ask the next question of, does this spread, does the effect the insect community who lives here, the thousands of species, do they spread out into here over time? Or does the impact just stay put right where it is? So you sit here and you look at this photograph and you think about it for a while and say, well, yeah, that is a kind of ugly footprint, but it's producing high quality uh, resources for the country. And furthermore, the country ends up paying the bill to, to mitigate the impact by saying, okay, what's, how, do we, how do we pay for this? Well, one, one way we pay for it is to simply buy another big chunk of forest and add it to it. The other one is say, no, no, we don't want, we don't want land. We want cash to build endowments. So the endowment then, then can keep the, the, the um, staff of the ACG running and doing, and doing all the things they need to do when we have an economic disaster as has happened in Costa Rica just this year. Because when COVID hit the first week of March, Costa Rica lost a huge piece of its income. It lost its tourist crop. And that was 10% of the national budget. They lost it, which the consequence being that in 2021, the staff, the budget for the management of 2% of the country has gone to zero. From the government standpoint, there isn't any money. However, if you look at it from a biologist's viewpoint and stop thinking conservation in the sense of emotion, suddenly you realize that that platform is a landslide. It's exactly the same thing as if a landslide sweeps the forest off of two hectares of forest. Bare rock, bare dirt, and there it is. So you're looking at a landslide and nobody complains about a landslide in a national park. Nobody says it's ugly. Nobody says it's an eyesore. Nobody says it's horrible. And national parks are full of landslides. There, 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 there. This is ACG. This is, this is us right here. That is a road, but it's not. It's a landslide. That's what landslides look like. Now I'm going to skip over, oh, excuse me, I'm going to go back, I'm watching my time here. But somebody will immediately say, any biologist will immediately say, yes, we understand that this is a, a landslide and it's not a problem. And in fact, there's often more species on the edge of it uh, to, to look at and study. If you're a bird watcher, that's where you go to find birds and all kinds of things. But the forest eventually closes over. But it's not going to close over your drilling site. That geothermal site's gonna be there for 30 years or 50 years, because when they take the hot water out of the, for, through the pipe from deep down inside, they use it to run the turbines and then they re-inject it. So you don't drain the resource. You put the water back in, it gets boiled up again by the heat from the earth 
and you recycle it. So what's going on? Well, you start thinking about it. Oops, I realize I lost a slide here. What I was going to show you after this slide right here is a river, an ordinary river flowing through the national park, flowing through the ACG. And what is the center of the river? It's permanently open and disturbed. The banks of the river are permanently edges of the forest. And then the forest is inside as well. So you have all three things. You have the forest here, you have the edge, and then you get the permanently disturbed site for a river. And nobody complains when there's a river flowing through a national park. So suddenly you begin to have a reason to, to reasonable think through. And part of the problem with the industrial system, of course, is that we as human beings all have very negative responses to the invasion of wild areas by industrial activity. I don't care what it is, hydroelectric dams or highways or you name it, urban areas, doesn't matter. And we have this negative response, but if you back off from the negative emotional response and start looking at it from an actual who's being hurt by what and how do you compensate for this other? It's exactly the same thing as the old analogy of a knife in the hands of a surgeon is a good thing. A knife in the hands of a mugger is not a good thing. And it's all a matter of how you see and fit these things into this unavoidable interaction of people with nature. Well, the striking thing for us in all of this thing was right at the end of this, there was a major conference in South America that was uh, developed by the international conservation community, um, bringing examples from this or that kind of standard um, guns and gold badges conservation. And guns and gold badges conservation is, you know, you. You, you set up a police force or you call them park guards and you try to keep everybody else out. Right? That, that's the standard um, military way of going at conservation. And that was the usual meeting. But the conservation area, the ACG, was invited to this global meeting. So we thought, why don't we invite the electric company to come with us? So this is like an Apple inviting Bill Gates to come and be part of their board meeting. Okay. And um, so the artists and the electric company went to work making this slide. Now this is the conservation community over here. Okay, this is all the tree huggers and the conservation people and people like ourselves that work and live and depend on wild areas. This is the industrial electric company over here. And this is the slide that they made showing that this piece can be fit into this piece. So this is how they or this is how they proposed to propose to literally hundreds and hundreds of uh, decision makers in the conservation community about this interaction going on in Costa Rica. Now, this whole project cost money. The money came from the government of Japan. Now, why is government of Japan paying the bill for this biomonitoring, which allowed us to say what the real damage was? This is the Japanese, basically this is Japanese tax money which is used for international development, cooperation, help. It can be for um, impact of a hurricane. It can be for uh, collaborations of all sorts and shapes between the Japanese government and other governments, all right? government to government. So why are they involved in this? Because Japan loaned $800 million to Costa Rica for geothermal development. So there are many projects, it's not just this one. And they didn't want to have a black eye on the international community. They don't want to start a project which then allows Greenpeace or other protesters 
to really make a scandal about how Japan is providing money to Costa Rica to really damage itself. So they came and looked at the biomonitoring process, consulted amongst themselves, and decided that, oh, what did this cost? And I tell them $400,000. I don't have the money. I'm a poor biologist. Oh, we can handle that. So they end up paying the bill instead of the US National Science Foundation, as though I had, had gotten a big grant to cover this. Okay. So all of a sudden, this becomes sort of the grease, if you like, because that financial support was there. This is allowed to happen. That's what international collaborations can be if they're allowed to be. Up here, we have three logos. We have the electric company logo in the corner. We have the conservation area logo here. And we have the international community, conservation community logo here. It's the only slide I have ever seen in my whole life that has all three of these on the same slide. In other words, this is industry working with the conservation community, not just greenwashing, not just uh, you know something to make yourself look good in the newspaper, but actually supporting the interaction between industry and the conservation community. And this was the particular example. This example is now being talked about and case studied and shown all over the world. Um, I have to give a talk on it on the 3rd of December to international global Zoom community. Um, and um, it's the kind of way that gradually with time, we might have some chance of getting the whole integrated human society actually getting to where they're willing to accept the reality of wild areas and wild things alongside humans, instead of feeling you have to just obliterate them by accident or on purpose in order to carry out the industrial stuff. So with that, I will, I will stop there. Um, I realize now that I need to uh, go back to this uh, slide presentation, and add a few more slides. So the one that's on, um, the one that's on uh, Canvas right now, uh, I'm going to uh, pull down uh, later on today and add um, a few more slides to this thing. And I'll put the slide of a river and a couple things like that and uh, put it back up again. So on this, on the um, on the website on Canvas, there is one publication that's put up with this lecture, and that one publication is a the actual scientific paper that goes with um, the project itself. And um, I should say one thing about that scientific paper also. Uh, one thing I said was it required a Norwegian editor uh, and a Canadian journal who were willing to accept the idea of this, uh, this new novel way of combining information in, uh, in, in one paper uh, to satisfy different sectors. Um, so that, that's one aspect of it. There's a lot of detail there. I don't expect you to memorize the detail at all. I expect you to kind of sort of work your way through it, looking at pieces that, that uh, trap your eye and thinking about them. Um, and the other thing about that paper is, uh, there's one more thing about <laughs> which I've now forgotten here. Uh, just let me think for just for a second. Um, ah, yeah. The, it's interestingly enough, uh, it has many co-authors. It's like 22 or something like that co-authors. Part of them are engineers. Part of them are hardcore biologists. Part of them are information scientists. Uh, part of them are wildland managers. Uh, but there's no Costa Rican government as a co-author. Because we had co-authors from the Costa Rican government. They, they contributed greatly. And then the Costa Rican government came along and said, no, that's a conflict of interest. You can't, since that's, that's our land and our projects, we can't be authors, which is a very different reaction by a government bureaucrat than it is by a university scientist, because the university scientist, of course, is, is totally involved in his own research. And of course, 
he's a senior author or she is senior author, and of course, very much always authors for their own research. But here we have the government carrying out this project, which is a form of research, and it won't let itself be co-authors. So these are the kind of social barriers that come along with this kind of biology. Okay, we'll stop there.